Hi, everybody. Thanks a lot for inviting me and uh, thanks a lot uh, for sticking around uh, this late. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some beautiful points of contact between complexity theory, game theory and machine learning. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, joint work with my amazing students and uh, former students and collaborators, uh, Noah Golovich, Stratis Pilakis, and Manoli Zampetakis. So um, uh, the faces that you see here are, are, are not uh, real people. They have been uh, dreamt uh, by a, a deep neural network that is fed uh, Gaussian uh, randomness, so boring randomness. And uh, that neural net, when fed uh, with samples from the Gaussian, spits out uh, samples from uh, an interesting distribution. Uh, this particular one, uh, distribution over human faces, which are a high dimensional, uh, very high dimensional uh, objects. And they have a lot of interesting structure. And uh, one way to get this, uh, these neural nets is uh, via um, a method called uh, Generative Adversarial Training, uh, also known as GANs, which I'm gonna explain in a little bit, but uh, it's basically uh, setting up a min-max uh, optimization problem. Uh, this is one of many uh, instances of uh, min-max optimization being used recently in uh, machine learning and deep learning applications, including uh, training robust classifiers to agent reinforcement learning and, uh, and many other applications. So let me explain to you how the min-max problem arises in the context of deep, deep generative models, so, um, which were introduced by Goodfellow et al. Uh, in, uh, in 2014. So the way um, you arrive at a deep neural network that uh, is fed uh, Gaussian inputs and outputs interesting stuff is you set up a game between two deep neural networks or, or better said, two agents who are controlling the parameters of two deep neural networks. Uh, one of the deep neural networks is the generator deep neural network, whose goal is as above, to be fed Gaussian randomness and spit out interesting stuff. Uh, the other neural network, which is called the discriminator, uh, has to distinguish between uh, hallucinated images generated by the generator and real images from a, a data set of real objects. Uh, so in particular, the generator's goal is to fool the discriminator and the discriminator is not to be fooled. And um, the hope is that uh, at uh, some um, you know, solution of the uh, zero sum game that you define, the generator generates interesting stuff. So you can set up various objective functions f uh, on the parameters of the generator and the discriminator to try to achieve this. One uh, nice one is uh, one pursued by the Wasserstein GAN paper of Artovsky, Tintal, and Botu, which, um, uh, uh, which uh, compares the expected output of the discriminator on a real uh, image versus the expected output of the discriminator on a fake image. So an image that is output by the generator when it's fed Gaussian noise. So uh, 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 just a clarification. So yes. the, it seems that one hard part, which you're assuming is the, how they do the hallucination. Um, so, but uh, you're taking that for as given, but it seems to me that a lot of work must have gone into that. No, not at all. I'm not taking it as given. So the generator is from a family of uh, very, you know, a family of functions that are parameterized by X, uh -huh. and the goal of this min-max optimization that I'm setting is to identify what parameters X to use uh, uh, to to get it in, to get a function that actually does a good job. So this is exactly what you're saying is right, but I'm not assuming it away. This is the real reason why I'm setting up a, a zero sum game. The goal of the zero sum game is to get access to that nice function. Okay, so how they do the hallucination is not clear. How you hallucinate an image is not at all clear to me. Uh, yeah, so you pass an input to a Z uh -huh. through a very complicated function uh -huh. that uh, outputs uh, uh, a square of pixels. And uh, your hope is that you will somehow arrive at a function 
I that see. when you feed it boring stuff, it actually outputs an image of a person. So mm -hmm. it's not at all clear why such a function should be simple or be expressible as a deep neural network. But uh, okay. the work that has gone into doing these things actually reveals that uh, this is possible. And it's I surprising. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the basic idea is to set up a, a min-max optimization problem to arrive at those uh, functions, a good generator and, and a good discriminator. And that's, that's one example of min-max optimization in deep learning. And um, the challenge arises from an optimization standpoint uh, from the fact that uh, the, uh, you know, so the objective function is on the parameters of uh, uh, deep neural networks and uh, uh, very commonly, the objective function is very non-convex, non-concave, so it does not belong into the class of functions studied by von Neumann, and the parameters x and y are uh, high-dimensional, so solving so solving this max optimization problem is not easy, and typically, uh, people try to solve it using some uh, uh, um, uh, uh, easy method, like gradient descent, and some variant of gradient descent, which ultimately, which boils down to having both uh, agents uh, uh, do gradient descent or ascent steps in parallel with various bells and whistles. Uh, but um, as it turns out, uh, these methods and their variants are not very successful in solving these min-max problems. So uh, they suffer a lot of uh, issues. So gradient descent ascent is uh, um, unstable. Uh, it uh, uh, it's cyclic, uh, it, may, it may get to garbage uh, solutions. And um, I'm not going to talk about the pictures here on, on, on the slide for the interest of time, but uh, the point is that uh, training guns is very challenging and feels more uh, uh, like an art than uh, technology. And the goal of this talk is to understand why. So in particular, what I'd like to do is to compare a problem that we know how to solve well uh, also, when the function is not uh, convex, and I'll, I'll describe what I mean by that, uh, and a problem that appears to be challenging in these deep learning applications, which is a min-max problem, uh, where you have two agents so that one is trying to minimize an objective function and the other is trying to maximize it. I'm going to study uh, such games, uh, thinking of them as simultaneous games, but uh, it's equally important to study them as Stackelberg uh, games and uh, 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 maybe using these methods I'm presenting today or, or, or different methods, but, but it's certainly also well motivated to study the sequential version of these games. And uh, again, I'm not going to make assumptions about F. It's not going to be convex or convex and cave. I'm going to assume it's Lipschitz and smooth, so the gradient is Lipschitz. And my constraint set uh, uh, in both cases is going to be convex and compact. So what do we know about this setting? In the classical regime, we make further assumptions. We assume on the left hand side that the function is convex, on the right hand side that the function is uh, convex concave, which is the von Neumann setting. And uh, under those conditions, the problems are very intimately related. In many senses, they're equivalent. And also, gradient descent is a very good, and variants of that are very good at identifying uh, uh, approximate global solutions. Uh, from uh, a number of steps that is polynomial in the approximation that you desire and the lipsits, the smoothness and the diameter of the set you're optimizing over. But I was, as I was saying earlier, the modern setting involves uh, functions that are non-convex. And um, of course, finding global solutions is intractable, but uh, uh, deep learning has been operating uh, 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 essentially operates uh, uh, um, uh, on, on local optima, not, not, not global optima, and that has been very successful in single agent learning applications. So what we're gonna, we're gonna shift our attention to locally optimal solutions. And in particular, uh, we're gonna define these uh, two notions, uh, uh, an epsilon delta, local minimum, is a point where X star, so that if you look in, in a ball, of radius delta around the star, you cannot decrease the function by more than epsilon. That's a local minimum. A local min-max equilibrium, viewing the game again as a, 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 a simultaneous game, is a point x star y star, so that looking in the, uh, around the star cannot decrease the function by more than epsilon. Looking around y star, you cannot increase the function by more than epsilon. 
So both uh, solution concepts presented here are uh, first order uh, uh, local optimality conditions. You can consider higher order local optimality conditions. Uh, uh, and for simplicity, I'm going to normalize my range to being zero one. So uh, if you uh, consider non-convex functions and uh, you're looking for local op locally optimal solutions, then if the locality that you're striving for, uh, if you don't become too greedy uh, as a function of epsilon and the smoothness of the function, then gradient descent is able to get you such solutions. So, you know, you may not go to the globally optimal solution in the picture, but you may go to a locally optimal solution. And this is what's happening in deep learning in single agent applications. Um, if you increase delta, uh, the solution concept still exists. Okay, so a globally optimal solution exists, so an epsilon delta with arbitrary delta exists. But, but of course, if you become too greedy, the problem becomes a global optimization problem. It's certainly anti hard. So you shouldn't be too greedy. <laughs> Um, but if you're not too greedy, and, and you know, greediness level depends again on epsilon and the smoothness of the function. If you're not too greedy, uh, gradient based methods, so methods that uh, query the function value and the gradient value, they get you these types of solutions. On the other hand, as I was saying earlier, mean max optimization has been challenging, and um, uh, we don't know what's, what's going on. We don't know even the complexity of getting these types of solutions. Uh, one thing you can show is that they still exist if you're not too greedy. If you're too greedy, they actually may cease to exist. But if you're not too greedy at the same level as on the left hand side, these things do exist. So that, that's, that's a good start. But the complexity is not clear at all. And practical experience suggests that the problem is challenging. So what we want to do is understand what's going on. And um, uh, 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 one of our recent results with Kulakis and Zabatakis is that there is actually an exponential gap between minimization and maximization. So um, first order methods, so methods that access uh, the, uh, the function values and the gradient uh, values actually need exponentially many uh, queries and steps to, to, to get you an epsilon delta local min max equilibrium. Even in this regime where they're guaranteed to exist. Um, uh, moreover, what we show is that uh, it's not just first order methods, but any algorithm, first order, second order, or whatever, will have to pay a super polynomial number of steps to get you uh, those solutions, unless uh, a complexity theoretic collapse, unless PPD class collapses to the class P, which many people find an unlikely collapse. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I'm not expecting everybody has heard uh, of PPAD, but uh, uh, I hope you have heard the class of pol pol uh, polynomial time and, and the class of non-deterministic polynomial time, and you're familiar with traveling salesman problem as being uh, P, uh, uh, NP complete. So PPD uh, is in between P and NP, so it's contained in NP and is it, cont and it contains P. And PPAD is, is the class that is characterizing many problems that are relevant to game theory and economics, or many equilibrium computation problems, as well as fixed point computation problems. So it's known, for example, that uh, 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 computing fixed points of Lipschitz functions and Nash equilibria and general sum games, normal form games, uh, is PPD complete. Um, so the class tightly captures the complexity of these problems. And what we show is that uh, uh, finding local min-max equilibrium, and this continues uh, zero-sum games with non-convex objectives is also PPD complete. So in particular, it is as hard as finding Brouwer fixed points of Lipschitz functions, as hard as finding Nash equilibria in table, like in normal form, general sum games, uh, and uh, at least as hard as any other problem in this class PPD. Now, uh, in view of this intractability results I was talking about for finding approximate local min-max equilibria of non-convex, non-concave objectives, and in view of the tractability result of finding approximate local minima of non-convex objective, a natural question to ask is, why is it different? Why is it easier to solve a min-min game compared to a min-max game? So to understand the difference, I would like to consider paths of local improvements of so better response sequences in the strategy space of the two agents in a min-min game 
versus a min-max gain. So um, I'm going to be showing, uh, on, so on the left, I'm showing a better response path of a min-min gain, where one agent is controlling moves along the x-axis and the other player is controlling moves along the y-axis. So in, in a min-min game, as you very well know, the function value must necessarily decrease along a better response path. So moving along a better response path makes progress towards a local minimum. And moreover, querying the function value along a better response path provides information about where in the path the query happened. Uh, so min-max games shown on the right, however, are, are markedly different. So, so the function value must decrease along horizontal moves, but it must increase along uh, uh, vertical moves uh, as those are controlled by the max player. And as a result, the function value can cycle over a small range of uh, uh, values in a better response sequence of a min-max game as, as shown in the figure. Uh, as a result, the function value at some location of a better uh, response sequence may not reveal much uh, actionable information about how far from the end of the better response sequence the query was made. So provide no information about the distance to a local min-max equilibrium. And in fact, as shown in the figure, like the cycle you see there, there might actually be no end of a better response sequence. So you can have cyclic uh, better response sequences in a min-max games. So intuitively this lack of information gain about the location of local min-max equilibria from querying the objective uh, function uh, lies at the heart of what makes min maximization so much harder than minimization. Uh, but, but to turn this intuition into an actual proof, uh, what we'd like to do is to hide an exponentially long uh, space filling like uh, better response path within some ambient space um, so that querying the function value along uh, uh, the path or in the ambient space provides very little information about where the local min-max equilibria lie. Uh, however, when we tried to implement this idea, um, we, we, we weren't able to, and we had to open, uh, we, ha we had to dive deeper into the topological nature of the problem. And in particular, uh, I, I appeal to this um, uh, line of work, uh, starting with Lemke, Hauson, Scarf, and Bob Wilson's uh, paper on computing equilibria in n-person games, which culminated uh, into Christos's definition of the class uh, PPD to capture uh, problems solvable by algorithms that are a uh, parity uh, type of uh, methods. So um, to connect those works to min-max optimization, uh, we define a, a variant of a lemma you might have seen, so Sperner's lemma, which is a classical result that can be used to prove the existence of Brouwer fixed points and the existence of Nash equilibrium multiplayer games. And it's used in the, in the heart of SCARF's algorithm for equilibrium computation. Uh, so both the original Sperner's lemma and the variant presented here uh, can be stated in arbitrary dimension. Uh, but here I'm gonna show you the two dimensional version that we use. And um, what we're gonna be doing in this variant of Sperner's lemma is uh, to color the vertices of a uh, two dimensional uh, grid using four colors, red, green, yellow, and blue. Uh, the boundary of the grid will be colored in the precise way that you see here. Uh, now the internal vertices can be colored in an arbitrary fashion uh, using these four colors. Uh, the claim is that no matter how we color the internal vertices, there must exist at least one square that contains at least the red-yellow combo or at least or the blue-green combo or both combos of colors. Uh, and, and one thing to note here is that um, there are six combos of colors, but these combos are the only interesting ones. All the other pairs of colors appear somewhere in the boundary, like red, blue appears here, uh, yellow, blue appears there, and so on and so forth. So the only interesting combos are red and yellow and, and blue and green. All right. So, so, so here's uh, uh, the variant of Sperner's lemma in action. Here I'm colored the internal vertices in this way. And um, uh, Sperner's lemma guarantees that there exists one square that is well colored in the in the way the, in, in, the, in the in the statement. And here it is. In fact, it's a unique one uh, in this uh, instance. Now, 
there is a simple proof of, of this variant of, of, of Sperner's lemma, which will reflect the, the uh, proof of Sperner's lemma, which you might have seen. It's, it's going to be a parity argument. But this parity argument is very illustrative into the nature of min-max, as it will turn out. Um, and it reveals the combinatorial uh, nature of the, of the lemma, both this one and local min-max equilibria. So for the purposes of the proof, I want to view this grid as a factory, which is partitioned into squared uh, rooms. Uh, each room has four pillars and four doors uh, defined by adjacent pillars. And the proof will define the directed path inside that factory. Uh, the first step is to go from the outside world into the factory by crossing the leftmost edge of the bottom boundary of the factory. So you enter into the bottom left uh, room of the factory. Um, note that three out of the four pillars of that room line the boundary. So their colors are determined by the boundary coloring. Uh, uh, in particular, no matter how you color the internal vertex of the grid, we know that the edge that we cross to enter into that room is a red blue door and we crossed it having a uh, red on our left hand. And now there are two interesting cases to consider depending on the color that the fourth pillar has, which is determined by the internal vertices. So this, 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 this guy here, this is not a boundary, this is not on the boundary, so it, it's out of our control. And there are two cases about uh, this color. Uh, one case is that uh, this fourth pillar that is not in our control is colored yellow or green. Uh, in this case, we're done because we entered through a red blue door and we found the red, a yellow or a green, so we're done. So we have either the red yellow combo or the blue green uh, uh, combo. The other possibility, which is what happens here in the figure, is that the fourth pillar is either colored red or blue. So no matter uh, what it is, whether it's red or blue, it will uh, define another red blue door that we can cross to exit uh, this room, having red on our left hand side. And this is exactly what we're going to do. So uh, our, uh, in general, our, our work is defined as follows. So we only enter into rooms by crossing red blue doors and, and keeping red on our left hand side. And we also mark the doors that we cross. So we don't cross them again in the future. Uh, now, whenever we enter a room, if there is an unmarked uh, uh, red blue door, which we can uh, use to exit the room with red on our left, we do so. And the picture shows what happens in this specific uh, example. In general, our work will be meandering uh, uh, inside the factory. And the question to ask now is what may possibly happen to our walk? And this is the heart of the proof. The first thing to note is that the walk cannot possibly exit the factory. The reason is that there is no red blue door on the boundary that we can cross to exit the factory with red on our left. There's one red blue door, but this is not a good one at the bottom left. Uh, the next thing to note is that our walk, so must eventually stop, it cannot go outside. Every time it crosses a door, it marks it, and there's a finite number of doors, so it must stop. So the last thing to ask is, under what conditions can it possibly stop? For our walk to stop, it must enter into a room through a red-yellow door with red on the left, and find no unmarked red-blue door that it can cross to exit the room. So what type of room could that possibly be where this happens? So, uh, 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 so it's important to think about how rooms may be colored if you use four colors. And there are three interesting uh, possibilities actually. So a room color with these four colors might have exactly four red blue doors or exactly two red blue doors or exactly one red blue door, but importantly cannot have three red blue doors. Uh, uh, so, you know, think about for a, for a second to, to think where, but uh, now, I claim that uh, the walk cannot possibly get stuck at a room with four red blue doors. Uh, the reason is simple. Uh, again, if you think about it, a room that has exactly four red blue doors has exactly two red blue doors that you can cross to enter into the room with red on your left, and exactly two doors that you can cross to exit the room with red on your left. And that does, does there's no way that a walk gets stuck at such a room because. The first time it enters, of course, there is a door to take to exit. And if you ever come back to the room, 
there's still another door you can uh, use to exit because there are two incoming and two outgoing edges. So they're, they're paired. Uh, for similar reasons, uh, you cannot get stuck at a room with two Red Bull doors because one is incoming, one is outgoing. So the only rooms where you can stop are those that have exactly one uh, Red Blue door. And if you think about it, these are good ones. So, um, so to summarize, uh, our walk must, must stop. And the only way to stop is to get to a well-colored uh, square. And that proves the existence of well-colored squares. So that's, that's great. So, uh, so far, so good. But, but what does it have to do with min maximization and, and min max, local min max equilibrium computation? We we'll argue that there is an that's intimate- Four minutes. Yeah. Oh, four sure, minutes. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, we'll argue that there is an intimate connection between the two problems. Uh, uh, we'll start uh, uh, by arguing that uh, local minimax equilibrium is not harder than Sperner in the following sense. You can start with the local minimax equilibrium computation problem and reduce it to the problem of identifying well-colored squares in a Sperner instance whose colors are computed by a function. And for simplicity, I'm only going to illustrate that in two dimensions. Uh, where one is controlled by mean and the other is controlled by max. So to do the reduction, I'm gonna um, define a grid over the domain, a very fine grid, and color the vertices of the grid according to the vector field V that you see at the bottom of the picture, which is the field of local best responses by the two players. So one is a mean, so he's going towards the negative grid in respect to his variables, and the other is a max player, so he, she goes to the, towards the direction of the, the positive gradient, so the gradient with respect to her variables. And depending on the direction of this vector field, we're going to be coloring using the color map you see at the bottom, uh, the vertices of uh, the grid. And what may happen is what you see in the picture. Assuming that the boundary is well colored magically, so Sperner's lemma, our variant, guarantees the existence of a square that is well colored. And uh, if your grid is fine enough, a well-colored square is something very good for us uh, because the way we chose our color scheme, a well-colored square, uh, well square is one where uh, both signs of the gradient with respect to X coexist in proximity and both signs of the gradient with respect to Y coexist in the proximity. And that's enough for a, uh, a, a local min-max equilibrium. Um, yeah, so, um, so if the boundary doesn't satisfy uh, the boundary coloring conditions for the lemma, we can deal with it by going to a lower dimensional problem, and I'm not getting to the details. One last thing I wanted to, to say is that uh, uh, we can take uh, one thing, one cool thing we can do is to push this idea to, a nat to its natural conclusion, taking the grid size to be very, to go to zero. And if we do so, you, what you end up getting from this parity argument is a second order method that uses gradient and Hessian information uh, uh, about your function. And it has a guaranteed asymptotic convergence to local min-max equilibria. Um, so lastly, as, okay, so we have argued that local min-max equilibria is, aren't harder than Sperner. We can do the other way around. We can, uh, uh, given colors of a Sperner instance, we can construct the function so that local min max equilibria are in, in, uh, are in correspondence with world colored squares. Roughly speaking, that reduction has a one player choosing square, the other player choosing doors, and you reward them or penalize them uh, according to the colors uh, and the orientation of the door that the uh, door player used. So in particular, we don't uh, assign the one direction to one of the players and the other to the other, we go to a hard dimensional problem. And part of the complication is we have to pass to continuum to get a smooth function out of this. But uh, the, 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 you know, the, the idea is that we can implement that with some uh, interpolation tools that guarantee you a, a differentiable interpolation. And the overall picture is that the problem is equivalent, the two problems are equivalent. And because of that, we get all the other color layers that I showed earlier. So I want to conclude with a philosophical uh, color corollary from uh, our work. Uh, and to remind you that uh, uh, deep learning, so single agent, uh, the, the amazing advances we've seen in single agent deep learning were obtained by using a very simple method, namely gradient descent and its uh, uh, various uh, variants. 
uh, to train uh, uh, a, a very complex uh, uh, um, uh, model, so uh, neural network, uh, uh, on a lot of data and on supercomputers. So I claim that uh, one step away from single agent optimization, so uh, two agent uh, optimization problems with uh, players that are directly competing, you encounter interactability result for these methods, first order methods, but also uh, um, any uh, method, uh, assuming P is different than PPAD. So I think the natural uh, philosophical corollary to draw from this is that uh, the multi-agent advances that we're going to see in the future uh, are going to, uh, you know, the, the, that progress will have a lot more texture. So, so uh, it, it will uh, um, uh, present itself for, for many uh, uh, cool uh, opportunities for interaction between uh, computer science, uh, uh, game theory, and uh, uh, algorithms and complexity theory and optimization. Uh, and um, that interaction has to understand how to model the setting in hand in, in a nice way how to choose the learning model. So not choose it to be an arbitrary neural net, but have structure uh, a, 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 that is meaningful from a game theoretic perspective, uh, decide what are meaningful solution concepts, static or dynamic, and design the learning and optimization algorithm that will learn from data, uh, the equilibrium or, or the other solution concept. And I think if we do that, um, a fruitful uh, a, a collaboration, then we will see more advances like AlphaGo and Libratus, which are two of the important advances in the multi-agent world, which, you know, so if you study them, uh, they're certainly not a blindfolded uh, run of a gradient descent, but they use a lot of interesting game theoretic ideas about uh, min-max games, around based min-max games, either with complete or incomplete uh, information. So that's uh, all I have had to say uh, thank you very much and uh, 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 congratulations to Paul and Bob for their many contributions to uh, economics and game theory, but also the interaction between the, those fields and in computer science.